uh, so I'm an, I'm an ALS researcher uh, and clinician at Mass General Hospital. And I'm going to talk today about using digital biomarkers to hasten drug discovery for ALS and how we might do that. And I'll say that I'm going to talk a, a lot about projects that I've done really in collaboration with JP Nella over the years, and it's been uh, incredibly exciting. So ALS is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The amyotrophy in the term comes from the clinically evident muscle atrophy. Lateral sclerosis is just scarring of the lateral columns of, of the spinal cord that we see on, on gross pathology. So that's where the name comes from. It's a motor neuron disease, so it just affects the motor neurons. Um, but the motor neuron has, have two populations, one in the brain, one in the spinal cord. Both are affected in ALS. It's sometimes called a painless progressive weakness. That's not entirely true, especially later in the disease, but we'll, we'll go with it for, for today's purposes. It causes weakness, spasticity or stiffness of the muscles, shortness of breath, difficulty swallowing, and difficulty speaking. And because there are so many modalities that can be affected and it can be affected in different um, orders and to different degrees in different people, there's a, sort of phenotypically, it's a very personalized disease, and that presents some problems in, in uh, coming up with clinical trials outcome measures that I'll talk about in just a minute. People survive on average somewhere between three and five years. That may be increasing a little bit, um, uh, which, is, which is a good thing, and we'd like to, to change that even more. There are, there's a lot of variability. So some people succumb to the disease within a year. Other people can live for longer than a decade. It's very difficult to predict that at the outset, although we're getting better at that too. We have two, two medications to slow progression, and one actually just went to the FDA for review uh, a day or two ago. So, so that's, that's nice progress as well. The trial pipeline is very full, and so there's a huge need for clinical trials, and we need those clinical trials to move quickly because the reality is that any given drug, the chances of any one particular drug working are, are fairly low, so moving through drugs faster is, is, um, is really kind of the way that we can increase our chances of success. Clinical trials of ALS rely on a few traditional ALS outcome measures. The first one, which really does the heavy lifting in almost all our trials now, is a questionnaire. It's a 12-item questionnaire. It's delivered in clinic or by telephone, actually, uh, by an examiner. And it's divided into sort of subdomains that I'll show you in a minute that have to do with respiration, uh, bulbar function, which is the, the, the sort of lower face, uh, so it's speaking and swallowing, and then uh, gait and fine motor function. We also look at vital capacity, which is a measure of basically how much air people can breathe out if they take a deep breath, and then quantitative strength testing, which is just testing motor strength in various muscles, and, and finally survival. Although as aggressive as ALS is, using survival as an endpoint requires fairly long trials to get enough events for us to, to have power, uh, statistical power, and we don't want to do that if we can avoid it. So this is the ALS functional rating scale, just to give you a sense. It actually is a, you know, clinically, it's a fairly good um, division in sort of where people uh, find, you know, ha have problems. And um, uh, again, it's divided into four subdomains. And we can kind of think about those. You know, when you, when you take a step back, you know, really when these projects began with JPNL, I was sort of, you know, the, the initial idea was, well, why don't we digitize this? Why don't we quantify each of these instead of having it be a subjective test, why don't we find ways to, to, to sort of quantify each of those? And that was an easy thing to ask, and it's been seven or eight years, seven or six or seven years now. Uh, so like most easy questions, uh, a decade is about the timeline it takes to answer them. The other thing about ALS FRSR is that it, we sort of treat its progression as, as linear, but the reality is that it's not linear, and there are probably various subgroups, and so this is some work that we've been doing with some colleagues at, at MIT to look at what those subgroups look like. Um, and so, you know, we'd like to have something that, that progresses in a more linear fashion as well. So digital biomarkers in ALS might quantify function. They might be simple to use and they might facilitate trials and inform care. But the reality is we need to really prove all of that. So I think researchers and, and people with ALS, which we often, often say PALS, people with ALS, and regulators would really like to move to digital outcome measures in clinical trials. There's a real push from, from actually all of those entities. And, and the issue is right now that we need to sort of, in order to do that, um, we need to prove that these are worth adopting. And, and so, you know, we need to gather the data to show utility. We need to feel comfortable with usability in this population, not a small task, really. We need to understand change over time. That's a key thing if we're going to put it into a trial. And then there are all these regulatory considerations that I think are on everybody's mind. And, and particularly when we're, when we're putting things into clinical trials, it's really important that we, that we wrestle with those. 
um, I think we're all fairly familiar, but just to say it, there's, you know, we sort of think about active data tasks often in the home environment um, questionnaires. It's a constrained activity, easier to analyze. The problem is that adherence is often fairly low, and I'll show some data about that in a little bit. And then there's passive data, which can quantify, you know, typical behavior using sensors. We've heard a lot about this today. Improve compliance, but there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of data, and we have to look at it in a lot of different ways, so, so the so computations become more challenging. Smartphones present a real opportunity because, as you've heard sort of in all of these talks, um, we, we have our cell phones with us. I mean, most people have them within arm's reach throughout the day. And um, there is even this, uh, this idea of nomophobia, which is a fear of, of not having your phone with you. And, and because they're loaded with sensors and we can get a huge amount of sensor data and we can also you know, have people do really relevant tasks on a cell phone. So with all of this in mind, we started the SMART study, symptom monitoring for ALS in real time. And this started a number of years ago. It uses a BWE platform. There's a front end to the platform. M many people here are familiar with it, but there's a front end to the platform, which is an app that's downloaded onto the participant's phone. The data is streamed securely and, and encrypted to a server, and then uh, it can be stored in the server. And actually now there's even sort of a back end to this that can do some of the analysis of passive data in the server as well. So when we set this up, we wanted to have a ground truth. So we, we did sort of build in ALS FRSR and vital capacity, some traditional outcome measures along the way. And then we, we asked um, some baseline surveys as well as surveys along the way. These are actually, we did sort of a pilot phase and, and we've had sort of iterations of this study. So, so I'm sort of showing sort of an over, overview of what it looks like. We've actually added a number of studies more recently, pardon me, a number of um, uh, surveys recently to this study to try to get sort of more patient reported outcome measures to go along with the, the uh, sensor data that we're getting. In ALS, one of the things that we've been doing for some time is looking at quantitative motor speech measures. These were always done in the lab. And so they've been very informative, but being able to move them to the to sort of the home environment is incredibly powerful because now we can do that really throughout a trial uh, much more easily. And, and the, the question was, you know, can we do this and get good quality data? And it turns out that many of the metrics that we use to look at, at quantitative motor speech analysis are actually fairly simple and the acoustics are, don't matter that much. Cell phones have very, very good microphones in them. They're as, in, in, in a lab, they're as good as any of the professional microphones that we use. Um, the only question really is background noise. Um, and, and then there are also some variabilities like how, how far people are holding the phone from their, you know, from their mouth when they're speaking. Turns out that's actually not as big a deal as we worried about as well. But the background noise does matter a bit. But when we're looking at some of these really um, heavy hitter um, features from, from motor speech analysis, like uh, pause duration or average pause duration, you know, actually background noise doesn't create that much of a problem. So we, in a small group of people, we looked at average pause duration, which is essentially we gave them a, a standard passage to read. And we looked at the total time that they're not talking and divided that by the number of pauses, which are all um, identified automatically, but curated by hand to be sure. And the average pause duration increased over time in all but one of the participants. And I'll say that I looked at that one participant and it turned out that actually the first recording was made around midnight and the last recording was made early in the morning and there were only a few data points in the middle. And so I wonder whether that slope could be influenced by when these recordings were made. And so that's actually something that we're going to look at in our next cohort. The other thing that we found is that because, you know, I told you early on that people can have weakness, they can have respiratory effects, or they can have bulbar effects, which would, would affect speaking and swallowing. So one of the things that we find in a, in, a, in a clinical trial is that if we choose an outcome measure like quantitative motor speech, there are some people who will not contribute to the data of the trial because they, their speech is not affected. And so we wanted to understand whether we could a priori set up uh, an analysis that would look at a subgroup of people who are likely to contribute data. And so we looked at people who had a normal speaking rate, which is above 150 words per minute, and people who had a slowed speaking rate, which is below 150 words per minute at the outset of the study. And what we found is that in the group that had normal speech, there were a few who had some decline, but there were many, many more who had um, a decline who, who entered the trial with already with a speech problem. And so you could sort of say people who have a speaking rate below 150 words per minute are gonna be our primary analysis group for this outcome measure in this trial, which, which you know, could be a really powerful thing to do. Um, this is actually early data and we've got a lot more data, but, it, but the trends are exactly the same. So the other thing we can do is look at GPS. Um, and we did this and, and um, 
we did this early on and we saw some changes over time in GPS, but a small group of people. And what I found is that a lot of my colleagues just didn't even believe that we could pick up any signal. <laughs> and so um, when COVID happened, we said, okay, look, we're gonna look in a small population of people who happened to be using our app at the time. It was only eight people. Um, and we found that these were a fairly affected group of people. They were spending 19 hours a day at home prior to the pandemic and post pandemic. And I think we used March 13th or something like that uh, as the cutoff. Um, and post pandemic, they were spending almost every hour at home. When we looked at public databases, the same thing, you know, there were many public databases that showed that people went from spending 10 hours a day at home to 14 hours a day at, at home, which is actually a similar numeric increase, but you can see how affected this, pa this patient population is. Um, so I think it at least um, in, is a proof of concept that GPS does reflect behavioral changes in this population. The other thing is if we know that the general population starts out spending 10 hours a day at home, and we know that our sort of more advanced cohort that we were studying at this time spent 19 hours a day at home. We, you know, we have to be able to see that change over time. The question will be over what time course. So we, as I said, we've also added patient reported outcome measures um, on the same mobile platform so that we can kind of annotate this information. And I think this is really critical because if we're gonna to go to the FDA and say we want a primary endpoint that is a quantitative you know, measure that comes out of whatever it is, a wearable, a smartphone, whatever digital uh, uh, platform we're using, we need to be able to tie that back to some importance in, in patients' lives. So this to me seems like a really, really important thing that we need to do. Um, and the simple thing to do is to use the ALS functional rating scale. And the first question to ask is, can you give that as a self-delivered um, survey? And there was a lot of doubt about this. Um, but when we did this, and again, in a small group of people, what we found is that there was a very high correlation. However, self-entry scores were a little bit higher, about 5% higher. So I'm not convinced that you can actually go back and forth and treat them as the same, but you know, we do get a very high correlation at baseline. We did this in a larger population using tablets in our clinic, and this is an unselected population, so they're not, not involved in research necessarily. Um, and really may not know the scale at all. Some of them, it was their first time coming to the ALS clinic. So um, we saw a little bit more variability and there were a few outliers, but again, we saw this sort of 5% offset so that people rated themselves about 5% higher, but a really high correlation. The other thing we did is look over time because that's a key factor if we're gonna use this as an outcome measure in clinical trials. And you can see how many more data points we got when we did this on the smartphone. Not everybody answered it every week when we gave them uh, the survey every week, but we, we got a lot of data compared to what we got in clinic. And the slopes were very, very similar, if not, if not the same, and certainly not statistically significantly different. So now when we sort of combine some of our PROs and quantitative uh, data, then, then we can begin to, to demonstrate clinical meeting. So, um, the GPS home time correlates with the ALS FRSR gross motor domain. This is something we would expect to see, um, but we certainly weren't sure. And as we get more data, um, that correlation is, is um, becoming more and more clear, more and more um, statistically significant, I should say. We also collected cough recordings, and we've done some machine learning modeling of these cough audio recordings. Um, and and what we thought is that, you know, cough relies on both bulbar function and respiratory function in order to generate an effective cough. And so if we just had people, you know, um, um, cough voluntarily um, and into, the, into the microphone, and we did an analysis of that and, and sort of set this machine learning model based on open smile, uh, loose on the data. And what we found is that we could identify with some, with, you know, with, with with some regularity, anyway, people who had bulbar dysfunction or bulbar and respiratory dysfunction, but not, we were not very good at just finding people who had respiratory dysfunction. Um, and I think this is actually, this was unexpected. It's something that we, we sort of really need to follow up with next step. So the validation work that really needs to happen and is underway now is we need perceptual ratings from, from uh, clinicians. So there are going to be clinicians who listen to all of these costs and rate them. And then we'll be able to sort of annotate the rating from the clinician, which is the best we can do, although certainly not perfect, um, uh, against the machine learning and how people are rating themselves on, on their bulbar and respiratory dysfunction. We also have a measure called communicative participation, which is a, um, 
which is a 10 item questionnaire that asks in a lot more detail about how people are using communication in their lives. Can they communicate with people for basic needs? Can they communicate with people that they don't know about more complex um, uh, uh, topics? Can they convey emotion in their speech? So it's, it's only 10 items, but it really digs into how we use communication. Um, and, and we see that it is actually affected substantially in, in people with ALS. But it's not widely used as an outcome measure. I think here it's perfectly suited because now we can say, look, if people are speaking more slowly, is their communication affected in, the, in this more meaningful way than just saying, you know, my speech is normal or abnormal, for example. And we find that when people are asymptomatic bulbar, that is, their speaking rate is greater than 150 words per minute, they're rating their communicative participation essentially normal in almost every case. But people who are symptomatic have a speaking rate less than 150 words per minute are rating their speech as affected and affecting their life. And I think this is a really, really key thing. So this is a big part of what we're collecting in, in some of our ongoing studies. So the other thing that we looked at was compliance for passive data and active data. This is on the same app. So it's sort of, you know, how much data are we getting in each of these venues? Because one of the reasons that we think that we're collecting passive data is because we can get a lot of data without bothering people a lot. We've used this study in um, three different, pardon me, we've used this application in three different studies. One, um, uh, two of them were observational. So study one was a short observational study. In study two, we increased the observation time. And study three was in a trial, small trial, open label of a drug called linocene. People are very motivated to be in treatment trials in a way that they're not for observational studies. And so, you know, we expected we would see the highest compliance there. And what we found is that, you know, compliance was actually pretty good in the short studies. When we went to the longer study, and I should say that we had really almost no mechanism to reach out to people to say, oh, you're not completing your surveys, we've noticed, um, beyond what the app did. So it's kind of a good, just sort of natural, uh, sort of, you know, how motivated are people to do these surveys. And, and it's surveys and also the audio recordings. And we use GPS as the proxy for uh, passive data recording. We have accelerometry and a number of other features as well. But, you know, we really just needed to look at one to say, are we getting the passive data? And what we found is that in the longer study, we did have a much more rapid drop off in um, participation in the surveys and the audio. And even GPS, you know, it's not like we get GPS from everybody. The reality is that the way that the phones work is that if you're not engaging with the app at all, it's, it will eventually kill the, the process in the background. And so we did see a drop off in GPS. Um, by 24 weeks, we were just below about three quarters participation or around two thirds of people were participating. If we look at observational studies that we do in the clinic, by the time we get to six months, so I've done this with blood, I've done it with spinal fluid, I've done it with questionnaires, we're always below 50% participation in an observational study. So even though these numbers are, you know, certainly leave something to be desired, they're better than what we do in, in most observational studies. The other thing is that when people, so then that was just sort of a, taking a measure of, are, are we getting any data? We also looked at um, um, sort of how much data are we getting when people contribute? And what we found is that at any given time when people are contributing, they're contributing more of the um, passive data than they are of the survey data or the audio data throughout really across our studies. Now, it does, you know, you can see here that in the um, treatment trial, participation was much higher. And I think that really bodes very well for putting any of these digital measures into clinical trials. Having said that, we need to train, you know, if we're going to do this in multi-center studies, we need to train the multi-center studies on how to use this app and how to instruct patients and, and participants and, and sort of why is it important and how do we troubleshoot. And I think there are a lot, there's a lot to be learned there, and that's its own talk, really. So we've also, um, in partnership with MT Pharma, we have um, started a study that we call the Smart Plus Wearable Study. Um, and the idea here was really to add wearables to the study that we were already doing to see whether um, the passive data that we're getting out of cell phones is comparable to the data that we get out of two different wearable um, devices. So one is Actigraph, which we've heard a lot, a lot about today, and the other one is from Modus Health, which is called Stepwatch. One is worn on the ankle, one is worn on the wrist. Um, and there were reasons that we chose one that would go on the, on the ankle. It wasn't just sort of two different products, but it was really to, to ask ourselves, does arm weakness affect the step counts that we get um, out of a out of a wrist worn sensor, 
And so we'll, you know, we'll, our hope is that we'll have some data to be able to compare kind of the two approaches. Um, and there are other groups that are using body-worn sensors, and we've actually done some projects with, with uh, some, some sort of other projects that put a cell phone just at the lower back for active walking um, and compare that to a wrist-worn sensor. So, you know, I think this is actually really an important question when you have a population that has arm paralysis as well as leg paralysis. So we're enrolling 50 participants. We're actually getting there. We should be enrolled in the next, um, in the next uh, month or two. I was also very skeptical, I have to say, that our population was going to wear the wearable devices because of their, you know, if you have hand weakness, if you have leg weakness, it can be very difficult. Just, you know, sort of any, anything, doing anything with any wearable, putting on clothes in the morning is, is really something we hear a lot of complaints about. And so I was really hesitant that we would, you know, that we'd have good compliance. Partway through, I just pulled the data from, from the people using Modus. So partway through what we find is that actually the compliance is, you know, really pretty good, at least through this study. Um, at, at least this far in. However, there are some people who are not doing a good job. And this is actually something that we've seen um, in, in the BWI data and in the wearable data, both Actigraph and Modus, that there are just some people who are not going to be good compliers. And that they show their colors actually really early. And I think that's actually important when we're developing a statistical analysis plan for this if it's going into a trial. Because it can be fairly clear within a couple of weeks that people are not going to, they're not going to do a good job complying. And so I think how we use that data may vary, but that's a really important observation in my mind. So I'm sort of right at the, the close here, but, but I want to say that one of the things that I have valued so much about the BWE platform is that it's open source and that it's really built to, to sort of build a community approach to this, uh, to, to, to digital data. We can get the raw data from it. We can get process data now out of the cloud. We can replicate data collection. There are open processing algorithms. The, you know, the, the app itself is open source. And so, I, and so I, I think you know, this approach, this sort of open science approach, is really key to moving the whole field forward. Um, and I will also say that actually the, the vendors that we've used, that we've chosen for uh, the wearable devices, give us the raw data give us the process data so that we can then, you know, combine that, we can, we can compare it, we can, we can really make decisions that will drive the whole field um, forward and create a marketplace so that we're not choosing one product or another product, but what is the right way to analyze, uh, to, to, to monitor our, our patients and what's the right way to analyze the data that comes out of it. So I think really critically important. There are a huge number of people who are working on this. Um, I collaborate with a number of groups in ALS, um, JP has been just a wonderful collaborator from the beginning, as I said, and there are a huge number of people in our lab who are, who are really putting their hearts and souls into making this project work. Thank you.